Welcome to the wide world of esports, the show devoted to all things esports. I'm your host, Catherine Knorr. Today, my guest is Bubba Gadder, the executive director of Varsity Esports Foundation. Our topic is Scholastic Esports 2022. Welcome, Bubba. Thank you, Catherine. I'm so glad to be here. I've watched a lot of your podcasts, your shows, your episodes, and a lot of folks. I'm honored to be one of the many in esports speaking with you today. Fantastic. Okay, so, uh, you know, we do have something interesting in common in that we both were involved in USA Triathlon. Um, (laughs) (laughs) what, what What did you do in USA Triathlon? Well, there wasn't a director, a, a, a certification for marathons uh, out there in the USA world, USA sports world. And the closest thing was a triathlon certification for a director. I was a director of a large scale marathon with 5,000 plus people here in Kansas City that was organized in part with Garmin, you know, the smartwatch. And so I organized that I was a race director for about four years. And I wanted to get certified because I'd like because I'm a millennial and I like having things after my names and I like being entitled and having recognition. So I wanted a label on my name and I wanted to have credibility uh, beyond just being a program nerd. And so I went to Colorado and sat down at USA Triathlon offices for three or four days and got a certification in USA Triathlon. And now I worked other triathlons throughout that space. I didn't, I didn't ever participate in any, uh, but I swim and I ride and I run plenty, but I just don't participate in those. And I think I will someday. Sure. I actually did triathlons for quite a while and I was the regional coordinator of officials for USA triathlon. And I attended a lot of those classes that you um, did. So what led you to kind of shift from uh, being a race director for running events uh, to uh, being involved in esports. Yeah, Catherine, my world really was sports for 20 years. And us in the esports industry, we call that traditional sports, even though it never was referred to that until recently. And that was 20 years with YMCA's, Parks and Recs, Chamber of Commerce, Sports Commissions, uh, NCAA. Uh, in AI junior college, I used to do a lot of stuff in sports, but I also am a huge nerd. Uh, my dad worked at Radio Shack when I was a kid. So I had the ability to build computers and be a nerd. And I never really used it other than just for myself and was a gamer. And I always knew it was a, um, a talent I should have probably done as a career, but I enjoyed sports. I played sports in college and I wanted to be in the sports industry. So I was, and I had a lot of fun doing it, organizing tournaments with 20,000 kids across a metro to a 5k for 200 people to um, organizing swimming events to hosting football tournaments, all sorts of stuff. And then there was an opportunity in the convention center space we had in a suburb here in Kansas City. And I said, you know, really cool to have a board game and video game type convention. And so I'm going to set that up. So I got a couple different people here in the Kansas City Metro together and host an event with 800 people. And that's where my esports and gaming career started as I also was starting to stream on Twitch at that same time. Terrific. And you have a lot of roles in esports. Tell us about what you're doing these days. Yeah. uh, You know, I just... I just am really me and the, the breaking into the industry was through a nonprofit I created with some friends here in Kansas city and working in the nonprofit world also for 20 years and all those different organizations. uh, I noticed there was a discrepancy and there was um, some issues with not being able to give kids access and certain kids. Uh, When I met the owner and founder of the high school esports league, he showed me a map of all their schools uh, and they were all in suburbs. There's about 1500 schools at that time. And they were all in the suburbs. And I thought, okay, my years of working with families and socioeconomic status, low area income areas and disenfranchised families, there needs to be kids in the urban core and the rural areas with access as well to gaming clubs or esport clubs in schools not just the kids who have, but the kids who 
are usually have nots because of systemic inequality or digital redlining, other things like that. Um, so, and I grew up inner city myself and I didn't have access either, but I'm also privileged and I got out. So for me, using the platform of a nonprofit to create that opportunity with grants and scholarships was where it all started back in 2017. And now the roles I have taken uh, on also have been ones just because I am an ambassador and an advocate and a consultant in anything esports and nonprofit and marketing. And I've been doing that kind of stuff for a long time, graphic design and media and marketing consulting for quite some time through all the, you wear lots of hats in nonprofit. So you, you potentially learn a lot of different roles and skills. So I just used all those to also teach other people. Sure. And shifting to our topic today, Scholastic Esports in mm -hmm. 2022. Mm. So what is Scholastic Esports? So it, that's a term we kind of use uh, broadly for anything K through 22. So elementary, middle school, high school, or you know, primary, secondary, um, and then also college or university. And that's, if you're in this space and you've, I know your other Scholastic Esports interview with Danielle Johnson from TechSef down in Texas, I mean, she's in the heart of it. She's an educator and she wants to help her kids work, uh, be a part of not just competition, as we know esports is competitive gaming, but the curriculum and college and career readiness side of clubs and schools. So Scholastic really is taking the competitive structure of gaming and putting it into a club such as taking football and putting it into a club or a team at school and competing against other schools or internally really you can scrimmage your own students in your school but that's up to the college level obviously since 2014 and even earlier college esports has been uh, growing and growing and growing and so has the high school space but there's this big shift uh, the past, maybe past eight years or so in the high school space, it's moved, it's shaped away from that competitive only to additional of curriculum and college and career readiness and STEM and helping kids succeed outside the competitiveness to that's now, as we'll see in 22, 2022, that taking over to where it's not an esports club, it's esports program. And you'll see that in the um, K-12 space. And you've been seeing Minecraft for a long time in the, in the elementary middle school space for kids learning. My kid, even at third grade, was doing a Minecraft, or not a Minecraft club, but like STEM-based clubs. And there was stuff around that. So in the college space, though, scholastic-wise, that's the big that's the big ticket item that people know more about in the scholarship and the amount of colleges and what's happening in that space with a lot of the coaches and staff and schools really engaging that especially during covid that expedited all that for all of us in the industry what do you anticipate um in the way of any change in scholastic esports in 2022 yeah i think i'll just hit back on you're going to see, you're going to see a lot more colleges. Uh, I mean, we just got a big study out from Chris Postel with uh, Esports Foundry that talked about the 600 colleges that he uh, interviewed or surveyed around North America. And I think about 10% of those were in Canada. And we saw a large increase, but we see these really great uh, numbers from his, um, um, his study showing the moving away from that competitive side only to it living under a uh, not so much in athletics like it didn't have to live in athletics at a college uh, institution or a university and what we'll see more is the amount of curric uh, extracurricular activities and curriculum and certifications and courses and majors and minors towards the focus of esports and not just slapping an e on certain things to call it as part of a minor, but really helping students and people in the workforce gain a little more knowledge around what is the esports industry and how do you run an event and how do you market for esports? How do you help influencers? How do you work with teams? That sort of stuff has been around for some time, but only in small pockets. You're going to see that take off. And you had, like I said, over COVID, a lot of people jumping into esports and especially in this classic space, helping 
uh, there was opportunity for people who were coaching or working in other industries or in businesses and they needed to, they also wanted to teach. That's how I started teaching the higher ed I was I worked in sports for so long. Somebody said, Hey, come teach these college students about sports and officiating. And I started a, a college class. I've been teaching ever since for eight years. So that's happening as well for the people in our industry who are going to the university level and teaching. So you're going to see that shift even stronger, I think, as well as more schools, universities especially, start adopting um, esports beyond just the club or student-led level. Do you think that there will be a point where more schools on any level will have esports programs than not? So let's let's go by the numbers. There's 5,000 colleges and universities in the United States. We the 600 number I gave earlier was were those schools that are really more invested beyond just the student level, but we know of about 1,800, 2,000 colleges and universities that have some form of a program. So we're kind of there in the college and university space in North America, uh, the United States mainly, but definitely not in the full, full all the way in from an administrative side at the university or institution. In the high school space, we're looking at about 5,000 of the 35,000 public private charter high schools in the United States. So we're definitely not there. That's a, that's a low percent, but it also has grown by three every year for the past, you know, four to five years. So it's going to continue to grow. And middle school space continues to grow. There's about a thousand of those 90,000 middle schools in the United States. So it's growing, but there's a lot of that, uh, that merging with the STEM based classes and Legos and other things that are happening in middle school, elementary uh, level. So this, we're not far off in the college space, the high school space, since there's so many, there are you know, uh, upwards of a thousand high schools per, um, you know, 500 to 1,000 high schools per state. And there's a lot of states at the state level doing something like Danielle Johnson's doing in Texas and James O'Hagan in Wisconsin and Minnesota with uh, Logan and Peter. They're doing stuff at the state level as the people in the state and not from a kind of top-down bureaucratic space, but a space where it's teacher building from a bottom up. And that's really where the groundswell is going to continue to happen for this classic esports space. So if you look at the students and their parents as a consumer, do you think that they're that they are really looking for the opportunity to not only have competitive options, but to have content that is consistent with today's tech environment where there's, um, you know, uh, game gamification or like use of games even beyond Minecraft. Yeah. The so the to the point with the parents and students. Um consumers, that's really the gaming industry, right? It's a hundred and eighty billion dollars in the world. So it's consumers and it's the average age in the United States is 31, as we learned from our friends at the Entertainment Software Association. Um 45% are female. Now the competitive side, when we talk about parents being involved in a competitive sense that's really low but there are some great parents who are all in just like they are for um, little timmy's baseball traveling team there's there's plenty of parents who are all in who get it mostly that millennial gen x generation who get it because they also grew up playing nintendo or sega like i did um but you still it's it's going to keep evolving and adapting now the the space, though, for those parents are is limited because there's not there's not a great way to connect other than that. You know, my parents, my dad played football in college. I played football in high school, so I he connected. He understood, right? He he is a nerd where, where he's a he wasn't a gamer, but he's a tech guy, so we can connect on tech. But had he been a gamer, maybe something in my life would have been driven differently into games was more a profession. So I think that's what's happening with the, the parent space now, especially for Zoomers, the Zoomer generation, those, those kids up to, you know, 95, born 95 and, and um, later that had parents who are 
Gen X millennials, and they are definitely engaging a lot more in the gaming and esports space because they're the average age of the gamer. And the things like Minecraft have been around Pokemon. I think it's so funny to see. I didn't really get into it, but it's just so funny to see people a little bit, you know, even 40, 42, I'm 39, still like, oh my gosh, your kids play Pokemon? What, what kind of stuff they got? Do they got a Charizard? Like that's that's interesting that they would connect that way. And the kids still do. My six-year-old, 10-year-old, and a 12 year old they like pokemon as well so if i had liked it maybe i would have connected but i like video games and i just downloaded a new game on their switch today for six bucks because i wanted to play four player with them so as kids and parents we try to connect but there needs to be some sort of line there that draws them together and it depends on generations i think you know and in another way of looking at it do you Mm -hmm. think that some parents would stay away from schools that have those programs. Yeah. I mean, you can compare that to really any activity. Uh, Sure. Let's uh, in hypothetically, let's say I, I don't want to go to Texas because it's all about football. So I want my kid to be more academically involved. Well, that's not really where we're, we're stereotyping, but that's a pretty common stereotype of they're all about football. So I'm not going to take my kid there. Let me take my kid up North because I want them to be in somewhere where that sends people globally to be recognized and get jobs around the world. Maybe Texas isn't that, that could be a very big sense. The the issue is here, Catherine, that parents don't know that it's even happening at schools for them to say no to it because it's such a small subset of every school that sometimes it's happening and the administration has no idea it's happening because it's a bunch of kids who got together to start a club. And maybe there's the, the computer science teacher who's, who is the sponsor and maybe the principal knows about it, but it's just something that's happening. Just like when I started a club in high school for certain things and no, not everybody knows about it. Cause it's just not, it's just not out there. So parents potentially saying no, the good thing is people can choose yeah, not only the school, but they can, esports isn't like taking over, like it would say, well, I'm not going to go to New Hampshire, because it's all about esports, all those schools, just like I would think of Texas. So it's not there that yet. yet. And I don't, I hope it won't be, because we're all trying to help our kids be smarter and faster and quicker. And we all want to live vicariously through them to, for them to be, you know, accepted and professional and have a job and all that stuff, the American dream. So I don't know if people are going to say no to it because there's a team there, but they probably will after they maybe learn out, learn that there's something going on in a school, potentially they say, stay away from that because it's a waste of time because there's plenty of stigmas. We could spend a whole another 27 minutes on about the stigmas of gaming that I'm sure you've covered in other episodes. Well, so um, there are a lot of parents who probably would have to Google esports because they don't even know what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, so what what do you think about brand infiltration in scholastic esports? Because clearly mm-hmm. every single game is um, uh, made by a particular publisher. Sure. And, you know, I mean, we're not talking about like generic math or science or or English. We're talking about a brand that's been created by, mm-hmm. you know, a, a yeah. Like, like, you know, Riot Games or, mm-hmm. or Epic. So what well, do you think of that? First off, the publishers have a ton of power, right? James Naismith created basketball in Massachusetts in 18-something, and basketball's been around, and there was 13 rules on the rule book uh, then, and now there's three pages of rule, three books of rules. But basketball is still basketball. I can start a basketball program in my house here and say, okay, we're playing a tournament. And no one would say, you can't do that because we own basketball. We own the ball. That's obviously different with the publishers. There is a lot of uh, IP and struggle with publishers and those games and those developers, especially in Scholastic. There's a lot of who's going to win and who's going to help them make money. And that's what they're looking for ultimately, usually. Now, but I would say beyond that, brands, when you're talking about infiltrating in schools, it's funny because we say like, okay, well, basketball is not infiltrating schools and school or books aren't or, and math isn't, but 
what about the curriculum we all have to pay for, like from um, McGraw Hill textbooks and all the salespeople that the district has to get involved with just so they can get a better price for a thousand books. There's there's already brands infiltrating, <laughs> unfortunately, our school systems, uh, Spalding or whatever for basketball basketballs. There's already brands doing that. We just don't look at it the same way. Like there's obviously a correlation to something I could say. We don't look at this anymore in life because it's just natural, right? So we as a new industry are, are we're, we are big gatekeepers. We are very big gatekeepers in the esports industry when it comes to canceling people and other th- sorts of things. But the scholastic space is an extremely big gatekeeper. Uh, there are a lot of parents and teachers out there, and rightfully so, they should have a say in things. And they do because it's a public institution and it's owned by the people. And the idea of brand infiltration is scary because one, we as esports don't want to be like other industries, but how long can we gatekeep until they're really, can we, can we delay the inevitable? I I guess because every other part of school has some sort of issue with it as well. Can we really hold off or is it just the natural way of things? I have no idea, but it's important for us to be vigilant and talk about it because if we're not, then we're just another thing. And yeah, it's, it's out there, but the brands and the IPs and the publishers and the developers, there's a lot of power there. And, you know, working in the title one space with all these schools, I can, I see that they don't really ever get attention, but man, if they had the attention of somebody like a game developer saying, Hey, we'll give you $10,000. I'm like, Oh my gosh, that's the biggest grant we've ever had in the history of our school. Probably so. And they would be all for whatever kind of thing they had to put on their jerseys or a, a banner in their school. That's just unfortunately a common thing, just as much as a, you know, insurance agent putting their logo on a banner in the basketball gym is accepted. So it, it's, where do we draw the line? We don't know because we're big gatekeepers. You know, it's interesting because as consumers, we watch golf and we see Tiger Woods with Nike logo on his mm-hmm. hat and on his shirt. Mm-hmm. And we don't even notice it, you know, or mm-hmm. under armor <laughs> on something, you know, because we're so used to those logo mm-hmm. logos on any athlete that we see. Yeah, And it was interesting because when I officiated um, international triathlon union events, we mm. actually had to cover the logos <laughs> on our hats, yeah. our shirts. We could not have any logos. Mm. Um, and, and so, you know, in when we think about, I, I think it's interesting how you said that they're already there, that it's that we have these, but we don't really notice it. So, I mean, you know, that's a really interesting point. Do you see in 2022, do you think that there's gonna be uh, new games that that are developed that, you know, that we don't even know about yet, or mm-hmm. that, you know, maybe something that's just started lately that will become more popular in a school environment? Hundred percent, Catherine. Uh, the next two weeks we'll have a new game, and then the next two weeks after that it'll be a new game. And every two weeks throughout the next fifty-two weeks, there's going to be something new that is hot, hot and happening in the space. But it's also some of these games get big because of influencer push or buy for marketing, where you see a bunch of gamers on Twitch playing a certain game because they all got paid to, and but they like it otherwise, and that's out there. And that's what draws people to a things like a Fall Guys or an Among Us. Among Us has been around for many, many years, but only picked up because of COVID and a bunch of people starting to play it that are high up on the viewer count for uh, online gaming and streaming. So that's going to happen over and over this year because the power of that influence is there. Just as much as, yeah, like the Nike logo is there, but in my head, I'm thinking I should buy Nike because I need to be as good as Tiger. That's why companies spend marketing dollars, right? And (laughs) that's why they do it. And they're going to do it with games as well. And even though there was a game this year that they said they weren't going to do any influencers, they, they, they went back on that and actually did not, not for the purpose of other developers. They just like that do, but they wound up doing it anyways, because they knew there was an opportunity there and they saw you know, the writing on the wall that they couldn't really make an impact if, unless they did that in this, in this climate. 
So it's going to happen over and over. And the new games that come out that we don't know about, yeah, maybe they've been in development for five years, but they're not out because it's some indie 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 organization, which indie games are a very hot item the past you know 10 years, I guess 50 years. Really, indie games have been around for a long time, but till now, there's now that easily it's easily accessible to create your kids can create on a code based program, a game, and we can create a game on our phone. So it's much more accessible, just like all the other things that are accessible in our technology age. Sure. And how do you think that the pandemic has influenced scholastic esports? Well, it's if and a lot of people say, I mean, when March rolled around 2020 and schools started shutting down and everything started shutting down, football teams basketball teams banned you maybe you could my my 12 year old did band over zoom which it's not the same right <laughs> he learned how to play the clarinet he basically learned how to play the clarinet but that was that was something you do maybe football coaches could uh, give assignments for workouts to go do in their yard or at that time you know we couldn't even go outside right because we could could we even walk down a trail in march it was much different right we were we were hand washing and wiping down our groceries compared to what we do now so <laughs> the jim gaffigan's new uh comedy routine talks a lot about that i think it's where i'm getting my comedy right now but that's the the covid the epidemic and the pandemic with with 2020 and 2021 esports was the resilient thing that we all talked about since march 2020 we've been talking about this that it's been the resilient thing because it's not something that had to shut down because it's already online yeah the opportunity to be face to face really hurt those brands really hurt those um, companies that wanted to advertise but they had to shift they had to shift to online marketing on Twitch, which exploded and YouTube gaming and Facebook and every other platform out there, ritual motion, those are out there doing things where brands can show off just like a TV commercial. Obviously it's even better than TV now on all the data we have. So it's grown and it's going to continue to grow because just as much as we like, organizations and companies aren't sending their staff back to the office is because, wow, my staff can actually do this. But then there's a whole debate there. We, that's a whole nother topic and in, in everything that's going on with property and everything else. But it's going to continue to grow because the pandemic expedited a lot of stuff for esports, this classic esports space as well. And we've seen nothing but growth. And those developers and those publishers, they made a lot of money off it as well because everybody was buying games, even those 31 year olds who hadn't played in a while and they bought new games to play while they were also working and hanging out at their house. You know, the, it seems like people recognize the fragility of this traditional sports situation that we can't always just assume we'll be able to get together in person mm -hmm. and have these traditional sporting events and practices. And that maybe there's a little bit more stability in being on the internet and interacting so that we're not, you know, getting our germs on each other. So, you know, I mean, that might be it, but tell us about Varsity Esports Foundation. Yeah, Catherine, just like I said earlier, we, a couple of years ago, started up to help with grants and scholarships to students in disenfranchised areas. And that's my main role in life right now for the past few years. And raising funds to support schools that are in need. Uh, Title I schools here in the United States, those are schools with high free reduced lunch um, needs, percentages, as well as schools in disenfranchised areas, low-income areas, uh, low socioeconomic status um, that are in, in need. So that's really our main focus. We've evolved to a lot more things into education, as well as creating videos to help people understand what is esports. So uh, parents can see videos and help their kids. We work with a lot of we work with a lot of other organizations. There's, you know, we were one of the first nonprofits in esports, and we're happy to be that. And then, it, ever since then, it's been a lot of fun getting to know a lot of other folks in the nonprofit space in esports and how much we've all been able to do and do together, and how there's a lot of fun overlap for us to combine efforts and help parents and kids and uh, whether it be uh, LGBTQIA plus and um, you know women and 
of students and schools and everything out there with the nonprofit space in esports, it's been fun. And so we just spend a lot of time connecting. I mean, the values for the foundation are my values because I run it and just want to connect people. And that's what I've been doing for a long time. And I want to keep doing it and keep talking about it. And if we're not talking about this stuff now, then when, and um, that's, you can find out more about us on our website at varsity esports foundation.com. Org. Uh, we take donations and they turn those donations right back into grants for students and schools in the United States right now, some in Canada, some overseas, so they can have access to esport clubs like the other kids do. Fantastic. Well, I think that's a terrific direction to go. And Bubba, thank you so much for being my guest today. I really appreciate it. Catherine, it was fun. I'm so glad and honored we could find some time here on the end of the, end of the you know, this uh, 2022 uh, opportunity for what's going to happen in Classic Esports. I hope to learn some more and maybe share some more as well. Fantastic. All right. And thank you to our viewers for joining us today. Next week, my guest will be Johnny Ryan Weaver of Click Gaming. See you then. Aloha. Aloha.